Thank you. So impulsivity, compulsivity. So these are candidate behavioral dimensions which may be relevant to a number of neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, they're linked, in a sense, by the concept of behavioral inhibition, and this Venn diagram captures that. What I'm going to be arguing is that um, these two constructs are, are very similar in many ways. Uh, impulsivity can be related in particular to anticipation of reward or reinforcing outcomes and occurs at the initiation or the beginning of response selection, whereas compulsivity is very much related to the end of a response sequence. And hence, you can define impulsivity as actions which are poorly conceived, prematurely expressed, so a lack of inhibition, unduly risky or inappropriate to the situation, and result in undesirable consequences. That's, of course, key. Whereas compulsivity, actions which persist inappropriate to the situation, and again, have no... Um, is obvious relationship to the goal and result in undesirable consequences. So the argument will be that these uh, dimensions are represented by uh, different frontostraital circuitries, and this slide shows you the, the human reinforcement system, if you like, defined on the basis of a number of lines of evidence, uh, including lines from preclinical, from animal studies, of course, especially those related to addiction. And this hot loop here uh, represents the orbitofrontal cortex, ventral straital thalamic loop, which we know to be implicated in reward and modulated by monoamines, in particular dopamine. Now, the discovery that this system is implicated in reward and its anticipation uh, has been mirrored by evidence in humans, of course, from Nora Volkow, showing reductions in D2 receptors in a range of compulsive addictive disorders, including stimulant abuse. And furthermore, um, a big question, however, arising from this is whether these effects, which one observes, of course, in adult chronic stimulant abusers, are actually resulting from chronic cocaine abuse, for example, or are simply uh, predisposing to this condition. In other words, there's a real issue of cause or effect here. And that's not easily addressed, actually, with human studies, if you think about it, because you can't PET scan neonates, and doing such prospective studies is completely out of the question. So how do you untie this Gordian knot of causality, if you will? The other important observation that Volkow's made is that this change in stratal D2 receptors it's also linked to cortical functions in the loop that I described involving the autofrontal cortex, such that low D2 receptors are associated with hypometabolism of the autofrontal cortex. So this dysregulation of stratum is associated with impaired autofrontal function. Again, there's an issue of causality to be explained. These issues of causality also extend to behavioral observations of drug abusers. So as we've heard, uh, drug abusers are associated with impulsive behaviors, measured in a variety of ways, which I'll review in a, in a short while, especially among stimulant abusers and alcoholics, as excellent evidence of increased impulsivity with clinical measures, for example, such as the Barrett scale, but it probably extends also to many other uh, polydrug abusing conditions. Again, the issue is, is this behavior caused by chronic drug abuse or is the impulsivity there before these individuals actually are exposed to drugs and may therefore causally contribute to drug taking? Now, this question can be addressed by prospective studies more easily than the dopamine receptors, but nevertheless, again, it's a, a difficult study. One can address the question alternatively using animal models, and in this sense, we're fortunate in that most of the human measures of impulsivity that are objective, including, for example, the delayed discounting we just heard about in the last talk, discounting of reward, or motor inhibition in the stop-signal reaction time task, or other measures uh, 
of impulsivity, for example, in terms of false alarms in an attentional situation, um, these can be measured both in humans but also in rodents. And I'm going to focus initially on one such model that we've developed where rats are trained to detect brief visual targets in order to earn food. If they respond in the illuminated aperture, they're rewarded with food. If they respond in the alternative ones, they're punished with darkness. And moreover, if they respond prematurely, and that's the main measure of interest in this, these particular studies, if they respond before the visual targets come on, they're also punished and thereby lose food rewards. So Jeff Daly in our lab found that when one looked at a large population of Lister hooded rats, found that there was a small group of about 7% that consistently showed high tendencies for this premature responding, this high impulsivity, even despite the loss of food reward. So this is a, a very consistent behaviour, uh, possibly uh, a trait. And in fact, breeding these animals has shown that this does indeed breed true. One can compute heritability ind indices, and we're currently undertaking a GWAS study to isolate the genes which are important for this behaviour. In fact, the relevant QTL is on chromosome 1. But for the purposes of this talk, it's interesting that these animals, although they have high impulsivity, are normal in many other ways. But one way in which they're not normal is in their response to, um, in their response to drugs, in particular cocaine. So using the, the classic... Ahmed and Kub paradigm of escalation, Daly and others were able to show that although these rats learn to self-administer cocaine normally, um, as they're exposed to the drug in this escalating schedule, they, they take more and more cocaine. So this is indicative, possibly, of a compulsive uh, cocaine-taking state. So the high-impulsive animals who had their impulsivity screened before exposure to cocaine, then demonstrate increased cocaine intake, thereby showing that the heightened impulsivity is not caused in this case by cocaine exposure. It may actually be contributing to cocaine exposure. These animals also interest in, um, in other ways behaviorally because if one measures compulsive drug use, using an adaptation of the procedure that Paul Kenny mentioned earlier, where rats are exposed to cocaine in a so-called seeking-taking schedule, where responses on one lever provide access to a second lever, uh, responding on which produces cocaine, but also occasionally produces electric foot shock as a punisher. So punishment considerably reduces normal rats' enthusiasm for cocaine and suppresses cocaine-seeking behaviour to a considerable degree. Uh, but this is not the case in animals who are high impulsives. So if you look at, at these particular histograms here, these are the low impulsives of normal rats, if you like, whose cocaine self-administration is suppressed virtually to zero by electric shock. The high impulsives uh, continue to respond regardless, uh, even though they don't have altered flinch thresholds, for example. So these animals... Um, this appears to be a good operational criterion for compulsive behaviour because the behaviour is repeated despite advert co consequences. And so um, impulsivity in this case is associated with compulsive drug use. And additionally, these animals, when um, their dopamine receptors are measured, exhibit reductions in D2 receptors in the ventral stratum, although not in the dorsal stratum, in a way which is correlated with their degree of impulsivity. And these um, early studies have since been replicated. So this is a very reliable finding. So again, these animals' D2 receptors are measured before exposure to drug, and therefore they are present before the drug and therefore may contribute to the drug-taking behaviour and not a consequence of it. Now, recent uh, data from uh, Bianca Jupp and Jeff Daly in our lab has confirmed that if one looks at the shell and the core regions of the accumbens, there are reductions in D2 receptors which are restricted to the shell region of the accumbens. So this is where the change is occurring. Uh, 
And that also shows reductions in the dopamine transporter. Um, there are no obvious changes here in the core, but other data are suggesting that the core of the accumbens is also implicated in this behavior. So recent structural MR data using voxel-based morphometry to quantify changes in gray matter shows a signal in the core region of the accumbens which is correlated highly with the degree of impulsivity. So in other words, a possibility that reduced uh, gray matter probably in the core region associated with probably increased dopamine in the shell together contribute to this impulsive behavior. In the core region, we know that the medium spining cells, of course, use GABA as a transmitter, and indeed, if one measures GAD67 there, you can see reductions in the high impulsive compared to the low impulsive rats. Furthermore, um, using antisense to impair these neurons, GAD67, induces impulsivity and thereby suggests that these changes are causally implicated in the impulsive behavior. And that leads us to a network model of impulsivity, which focuses, of course, on the accumbens and a possible opponent interaction between the core and the shell. But we know from other data on this task that other influences, both top-down and bottom-up, modulate this impulsivity. So, for example, we know that prelimbic and limbic, infralimbic, top-down influences regulate impulsivity in this task, which is uh, consistent with the data shown by uh, Serge Ahmed. Um, there are additional changes in the anterior cingulate cortex as well. Moreover, bottom-up influences, including serotonin neurons and also the locus cerealis, probably projecting to the shell, also modulate this impulsive behavior. So we're building up a neurocognitive endophenotype, if you like, which may uh, predict uh, susceptibility to chronic stimulant compulsive drug-taking behavior. And we can make some predictions from this. The fact that the core region of the accumbens is implicated in, in impulsivity is consistent with earlier evidence we've had using the discounting of reward model of, in, of, of impulsivity. In other words, impulsive choice, which is shown here, these are discounting functions. You may remember that Rudolf Cardinal a decade ago showed that damage to the core region of the accumbens induces impulsive choice. So that's consistent with these data and shows with a different paradigm the same effect, thus enhancing the evidence for a construct of impulsivity. Both impulsive action and impulsive choice appear to uh, be regulated in part by the nucleus accumbens core. And of course that further predicts that the high impulsive rats would show steeper discounting behavior, and indeed they do, as you see uh, in the left-hand panel here, the high impulsive animals show very steep discounting and almost entirely take the small immediate reward. In other words, they're biased to now. So this fits together, suggesting that the accumbens has a major role in the control of impulsivity and in the control, if you like, of the anticipation of reward, consistent with data from Schultz and others. And when it goes wrong, it seems to be predictive of propensity to stimulant abuse. But how does this relate to human drug abuse? Uh, can we take any inspiration, if you like, from these studies and show their relevance to human drug taking? And to do that, Karen Ursher and Ed Bullmore and I have um, initially taken the Barrett Impulsivity Scale, which is a self-reported questionnaire, which asks questions like, are you restless at lectures? Uh, do you switch your jobs a lot? Do you blurt out things in public? You know, those kind of measures of impulsive behavior. And we studied not only drug users, who of course show greatly increased impulsivity, but also their non-drug-taking siblings, who show the intermediate levels of impulsivity that are consistent with an endophenotype account of these data. So within the family, the sibling also shows significant impulsivity, although, of course, they do not become uh, drug-addicted, as their siblings do. This is true on all the subscales of the Barrett. Intriguingly, for sensation-seeking, we don't find this relationship. 
Uh, this is consistent, and I can talk further about it, although, of course, drug users do show enhanced drug seeking, uh, sensation seeking. So impulsivity, at least as measured in this clinical rather inexact subjective way, uh, suggests that impulsivity in human abusers is also an endophenotype. So recently we've been interested in converting the animal paradigm to the human because actually that's where the animal paradigm came from originally, the five-choice serial reaction time task. And this is a four-choice serial reaction time for humans where the interest is to measure impulsivity. So the subjects put their finger on a button and they have to detect this brief flash of light as quickly as possible, release the button and point to the light on the touch screen and then they're rewarded. And motivation motivational manipulations make them respond quickly. So this is a way of measuring impulsive behavior in humans, which is certainly analogous to that in the rodent. And the preliminary data um, are suggesting some interesting results because both in our stimulant group and in our recreational cannabis users, who are also associated with high levels of impulsivity, we see huge increases in premature responding in this procedure. But we haven't yet studied siblings uh, using this paradigm. What we have done with siblings, however, is use yet a third measure of impulsivity, the stop signal reaction time task. For those of you unfamiliar with this test, um, you're supposed to respond in a choice reaction time manner to the direction of the arrow as quickly as possible. But on a proportion of trials, you get a beep which says don't respond on that trial. And that beep can be offset variably from the imperative signal to make it quite demanding for you to inhibit the response once initiated. You can imagine doing this task, you're just pressing the damn button down and the beep signs, you know, so then you have to inhibit that response. Uh, this is a very sensitive measure of impulsivity, for example, in ADHD. It, a lot of human data with patients with lesions and imaging and also rodent data, because we have a rodent analogue, suggests this neuronal network to uh, mediate stop signal inhibition. It depends more on the dorsal stratum, intriguingly, than the ventral stratum. But again, there are very prominent top-down influences, including the lateral frontal cortex, again consistent with uh, what Serge was um, suggesting. Just to show you a snapshot of these data, intriguingly, we find that the siblings of drug users are very poor at this task and show credibly slowed stop signal inhibition, uh, almost as bad as that of their drug-taking siblings. And these effects are correlated with changes in white matter, specifically innovating frontal lobe areas. And we know from other evidence that this is likely to be uh, the right inferior frontal cortex and the pre-supplementary motor area. So, again, these are potential endophenotypes based on inhibition, based on impulsivity uh, for stimulant drug uh, addiction. Now, in the last part of the talk, I want to talk a bit about compulsivity. Um, impulsivity is linked to ADHD and substance abuse, as we've seen. Compulsivity, perhaps the prototypical disorder, is obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. But I'm also going to argue that addiction itself um, results from a transition from impulsive to compulsive states. And so one may have a transition here, which is diagrammed uh, also here in terms of this cycle, and probably related, we think, to a devolution of control from ventral stratum in this Habron and, and colleagues anatomical rendering from ventral stratal to dorsal stratal structures. Now, I don't have time to review all of the evidence supporting this model, but the behavioral account of it is as follows, that in addiction, learning is clearly very important and so is the control of instrumental behavior or action outcome learning or goal-directed learning. So clearly the seeking behavior that we saw earlier and the taking response lead to the drug reinforcer. Our argument is that as with other reinforcers, extended training or exposure to this learning situation enhances the propensity for habit learning. And habits may be an important building block for compulsive behavior. Habits are defined when 
the goal becomes less important, becomes devalued, if you like, and yet the behavior continues semi-automatically in a compulsive-like way. So the, the suggestion is that underlying compulsive behavior and underlying this drift from ventral to dorsal straital control is a drift from goal-directed to habit-based compulsive behaviors. Now, we know a good deal about the neural systems involved in uh, this learning in humans and in rodents. So these are imaging studies of the goal-directed system, which implicates this ventral medial orbitofrontal cortex region and, of course, the ventral stratum. And the dorsal stratum and the putamen in humans mediates habit-based learning, which is measured in rodents by goal devaluation, as in these uh, seminal studies by Bernard Belain's group. So we have a way, therefore, of studying the role of these circuits in the transition in addiction from impulsive behaviors based on goal-directed behavior to compulsive behaviors based hypothetically in part on an exaggeration of habit learning. And now I'm going to illustrate that in the last few minutes is by reference to the prototypical disorder, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So this is manifest in a number of ways. Here's a typical Cambridge Fellows office. You see here this compulsive hoarding behavior, but it, it's also expressed in, in various other ways and can be studied in terms of goal-directed versus habit-based behaviors using particular paradigms which pit these different forms of learning against one another. So again, I can't go into too much detail here, but... This is an associative learning paradigm for humans where you have to learn to maximize your points um, by choosing the appropriate boxes with fruits on to gain other fruits that are associated with particular point scores. At a certain stage of the task, after initial learning has occurred, some of the rewards are devalued and no longer earn points. And then your behavior is studied under these devaluation conditions in two main sets. In the first of these, you can see that OCD patients are very bad actually at remembering or learning the consequences of their actions, in other words, goal-directed behavior, but they have a shift towards habit learning, in other words, learning what to do, so that when they're cued with an appropriate stimulus, they will perform that response even though it's for a devalued goal. So in other words, they will respond automatically to the stimulus to perform the response most associated with it. So there's a drift, if you like, to habit-based learning. We see this as well with aversive learning in OCD. So these subjects are trained to avoid shock uh, to the yellow or to the red stimulus um, applied to either wrist, the other stimulus being neutral. And then after learnings occurred and overtrainings occurred, one of the shocks is disconnected in full view of the subject, so they know they're not shocked. And they're studied in extinction, and we find consistently that OCD patients are more persistent under those conditions. So when the shock is devalued, they nevertheless continue to respond and produce amazing excuses for this bizarre behavior, like I felt I had to continue. So their urge to respond uh, increases. So clearly what I've been arguing in this lecture is some kind of commonality or overlap between chronic drug addiction and OCD. And I'll just give you one example of that before I close, which is based on a resting state functional connectivity study we've performed of a group of patients with chronic stimulant abuse and also with OCD compared to controls. So what these subjects do is they lay in the scanner and they fixate on the cross. They don't have to do anything else. And we just measure simply the bold activity occurring in this resting state and how it varies among 50 defined regions of interest in the cortex in terms of intercorrelation. And take that as a proxy measure of the connectivity of these nodes. When you do that, rather amazingly, the only nodes which seem to be disconnected in both patient groups are in the same place. They're in the frontal pole and the orbitofrontal cortex here, particularly on the right side of the brain. You see this measure here. 
So that's quite surprising that you have a common change in the autofrontal cortex in chronic drug abusers and OCD patients. And intriguingly, in both cases, it's associated with compulsive behavior. In the case of OCD, it's associated with the clinical scale for OCD, which of course measures check-in and hand-washing and those things, as you see here. In the case of the drug abusers, it's associated with a questionnaire on compulsive drug use, which asks questions like, do you like to do drugs, or do you like drugs? And the compulsive behavior often comes out as a positive response, I do drugs rather than I like drugs which is indicative, probably, of a compulsive or habit-based tendency. But the fact that you have compulsivity in these two very different phenotypes associated with the same part of a network controlling compulsive behavior, I think is very uh, interesting and suggests, indeed, that a construct like compulsivity can um, cut across traditional diagnostic categories in this way. So finally, just to sum up, uh, what I've been arguing essentially is that the frontostratal systems, which you see diagrammed here, from the ventral stratum to the dorsal stratum, from impulsivity to compulsivity, um, are associated with, with different behaviours associated with these extreme uh, dimensional definitions. So waiting for reward... Um, DRL performance, as mentioned earlier, is a measure of impulsivity. Five choice, it's very much associated with this circuit. Stopping, stop signal inhibition with this circuit involving the chordate nucleus. Uh, shifting, I won't talk about, but goal directed behavior in general is associated with activity in these circuits. And habit learning, and we think compulsivity ultimately with the putamen, which I mentioned at this uh, given. Uh, pause data that in chronic drug users you can see biochemical changes in the putamen uh, which might be correlated with their compulsive drug use. So with that, I thank you very much and my colleagues and collaborators, in particular Barry Everett and Jeff Daly for the animal work and Barbara Sahaki and Ed Bullmore and Karen Ursher uh, for the work on humans. Thank you very much. I've got to, you know, I, I think about this in a very crude way, actually, but we, we have done an experiment which I think is quite interesting where we've actually given a D2 agonist to drug abusers on a reversal learning task, which we know is very sensitive to the efficient functioning of that orbitofrontal loop. And D2 agonist improves their behavior, which is initially very perseverative. And we know that the perceptive behavior is associated also with uh, lesions of that area or reductions in dopamine in that area. So presumably the D2 agonist is somehow restoring tone to that circuitry which makes it work better again. So the impact of the drug is at the straighter level, presumably, but this change um, perhaps reboots the circuit, including the autofrontal cortex, back into functionality. That's, it's a really, really interesting question. First of all, it probably does generalize to nicotine. So the Dutch group have done that. Very parallel set of data. Not entirely the same, but you know, pretty similar, actually. They haven't, though, studied compulsive nicotine self-administration with foot shock yet, but that would be an interesting thing to do, possibly. Um, heroin, it doesn't work. So in our hands, high impulsive rats do not take more heroin than normal. So we think this may be a different substrate. And given our view that alcohol is somewhere between opiates and stimulants, I suspect that we'll find that there will be a weak effect with alcohol when someone does the experiment. But that has actually been done at the moment. <laughs>
That's a really, really interesting question. Yeah, of course, ADHD is, you know, a common comorbidity with, um, with stimulant drug abuse, actually, in particular. And, you know, that, that does fit from that perspective, I think, probably. Um, ADHD, again, I think it's, uh, it's something where the, the impulsive state in ADHD overlaps with that in stimulant addiction, but it's not exactly the same, almost certainly. But I'm sure it overlaps. And one interesting, a couple of interesting bits of evidence for that are as follows. First of all, um, atomoxetine, which, as you know, a stratera is used in the treatment of ADHD, is very, very effective at normalizing our high impulsive rats, particularly if it's infused into the shell region of the accumbens. Secondly, uh, this drug, atomoxetine, amazingly reduces relapse to amphetamine using the kind of models Serge was talking about, including punishment-induced abstinence, and, and um, also reduces drug-seeking for cocaine and heroin, actually. So there are interesting commonalities here between drugs which are effective in ADHD, or quite effective, it's not that wonderful, um, and the control of impulsivity in rats, anyway, and their drug-taking behaviours. Now, we're, we've actually been funded to try atomoxetine in stimulant abusers to see whether we can get a signal. Now, it has been tried before um, without great success, but they, they did insist on using very chronic stimulant drug abusers, and I think by then it may be too late. I think for a drug like atomoxetine to work in drug abuse, it's got to be somebody who's treatment-seeking early in the course of the disorder before it becomes compulsive, if you see what I mean. So it's a very interesting issue. Okay, I was going to ask about plasticity from those different substances. I wonder whether that would explain the change in plasticity. Well, I think that's also a really interesting question because one, one of the... Yeah, I mean, this complex nexus of causal factors involved, you know, is, is you know, one possibility, of course, is that the frontal cortex is poisoned, at least temporarily, by drug exposure. And that's entirely possible. And, of course, by removing that top-down control, you just add to the problem. So I don't, I don't think all of this, all of these factors are pre-morbid. Of course they're not. Um, some of them were probably caused by the drug taking itself and wraps into the um, cascade of causal factors which lead you to a compulsive drug taking state governed by the dorsal stratum largely. 